I used to play guitar in it. It was called Stable Table and the Square Chairs. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we, we, never, we never did a gig. <laughs> so, but that was, that was the first band. <laughs> That's one of the best band names I've ever heard. That's brilliant. I know. Maybe we should have a comeback. My guest today is Sydney keyboardist, songwriter and producer Daniel Pliner. From Darth Vegas to Veneno, Watusi, The Sticks, The Strides, Ash Maddox, Derebin The Ambassador, The Nick Garbett Quintet, Barefoot Divas, Wallace, Oyobi, Third Eye Lazy Cat and many others, as well as his own project and alter ego, Plain Face, Daniel's got his fingers in a hugely eclectic body of work. He's a master keyboardist and sound designer and clearly versatile enough to play anything from metal to Latin to classical to cinematic dub, which makes him one of the most in-demand cats around. He's humble, eclectic, eccentric, and he's a genius. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for the Plinosaur, Mr. Daniel Pliner. I think we're rolling. Welcome to the Gig Life Podcast, Mr. Danny Pliner. How are you, man? Hey, thanks, Steve. I'm good. Good. Um, I'm very happy to be doing it. Great. We, um, I actually contacted you really, really early on this podcast. Like, wasn't long after I'd interviewed Adam Ventura, and I yeah. think Adam was like episode number four. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think that was the first time I may have contacted you asking about it, and I, I think you might have had a fair bit on and. Maybe also thinking, who the fuck's this guy? I don't have that much on now. <laughs> um, but yeah, me and Adam go way back. I know, we I know. play a lot of music together. He's a, he's a cool cat, man. Amazing person, cool musician. Just, um, yeah, he's, he's a boss. Yeah. Yeah. Man, um, how's the last few months been for you? Um, what were you up to before the whole COVID thing happened and um, what got blown out? Um, yeah, I um, well, I guess the main thing is I had had gigs before, mm. like every working musician, and um, now I don't. Well, the few have started to come come in, like in the last few weeks, um, and the whole thing's been like kind of ups and downs. Like, um, an up was was when JobKeeper came through. You know, like that's pretty much a lifesaver. Um, and, uh, yeah, but, you know, obviously the, the amount of work has gone down, you know, it went down to nothing mm-hmm. and, uh, like I, I have a bit of a home studio set up. So for me, it was a good time to, you know, to, to focus on that and just practice, uh, work on my music. So from that side of things, it was, it was not a bad thing, but, um, yeah, just trying to find work and mm. uh, you know teaching as well. Like I've I've been doing a little bit of that over Zoom as well, but uh, it's yeah limited. Mm. Um, when you're saying the gigs are starting to come back, how many sort of gigs are starting to come in now? Are we looking yeah. further on August, September, October? N- no, just sort of I mean I do have yeah. Just as we go, I've mm. got some things in uh, in November, but you know. Whether they'll really happen, I don't know. Um, that's yeah. So, I uh, the gigs that I have been doing are just local, like uh, over at Lazy Bones. If you're yep. from Sydney and you're listening to this, mm-hmm. you would know Lazy Bones in Marrickville. Um, and when the gigs first came back, like uh, thanks to Adam Ventura, mm. we were in on there the first night that Lazy Bones came back. There was a ten person maximum, and it's just. It was a really beautiful night, um, just playing music to a small group of people, and 
being able to to play for ten people and that's all that's expected was actually a really good experience. Um, and just appreciating what it actually is to play music in front of people, you know, when it's taken away from you, uh, it can help to appreciate what you actually experience on a day to day basis. Yeah. But even even if you took the people away, you, you're up on a stage with your mates playing again. Yeah, too, you know. Actually, the first gig we did was just just, just the three of us to know people, not no people, yeah. just the staff, no uh, no clients. The staff are definitely people, of course. But um, yeah, it was like we got this gig, and they're like, "Do you want to come in the day before to rehearse and set up?" And we we're like, "Yeah, of course we do." <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's a change. Yeah. Um, and it was so nice to play. And uh, if you're a local and you've been to Lazy Bones, you might know Tim, the um, DJ Nothing, who uh, sound guy, DJ, all round legend. He recorded us to straight to an Akai tape player, um, which just sounds awesome. Mm. Is is that going to be available? I was still sorting through it, but hopefully, okay. hopefully, some parts from that will be available. That's cool. And the, yeah, and that was with with a group uh, called Third Eye Laser Cat mm-hmm. with Declan Kelly on drums and yep. Adam Ventura on bass, and we were just improvising. That w- um, was that the that, that was the rooftop gig, eh? Ah, that we did the rooftop as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched that. I watched that stream. You were one of the two people. <laughs> yeah, you said that. One of a couple of people. Anyway, I enjoyed yeah. it, man. I was, I was sitting oh, at my table you. upstairs. I had, had some beers there and it was a trip, man. I loved it. Just man, my, that's what it's about. On and yeah. It was awesome. I'm so glad that, that you were watching it. Yeah, it was really cool. Yeah. All right, man, let's um let's roll right back to the early days of, of Daniel Pliner. Yeah. Um, you were mm. born in Sydney. Yeah, 1982. So you're an 80s boy. Yep. Yep. Um, when did music become apparent to you? Um, do you have a musical family? Was there instruments around the house? That kind of thing. Yeah, we had a piano in our house, an upright piano that um, my grandfather bought. No, sorry, my great grandfather bought for my grandmother, mm. and. Um, Apparently he was a heavy drinker um, slash alcoholic and he'd kind of bought it on consignment Mm -hmm. and apparently this piano used to get wheeled out every month when he couldn't make the payments. So depending, (laughs) you know, depending on the state of his drinking. um, And then they'd bring it back when he paid. Well, yeah. And then then he'd, he'd, yeah. That's awesome. um, Kind of get it back and it just kept going in and out of the house apparently and uh <laughs> luckily eventually he he paid it off and um my grandma gave that to my mum and so i i grew up with that in the house right so did you um, start sort of tinkling on it early on yeah i had also just just in the neighborhood we had a piano teacher lynn williams who's a actually a concert harpist and runs a children's choir um so she was a good teacher because she wasn't just stuck in the the piano like the instrument. She was more of like just kind of gave me a, a broader sense of music, which was probably I didn't think about an influence at the time, but I'm you know looking back at I think it is. Mm. Who were some of the um, the artists and the bands and the music that was getting played around the house by mum and dad, and or also maybe music that you're teacher had introduced you? Yeah, so my parents, neither of them are musicians, but they listen to heaps of music. Um, They had a big tape collection and um, some of the things, some classical music, um, uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of who was, there was one particular composer which just escaped me uh, that we used to listen to more than others. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then also their... um, my parents were born in South Africa, so they had a lot of South African music. Um, they had this band Jaluka, which was kind of like an early crossover black and white band. Like they used a, uh, a lot of Zulu music mm-hmm. influences as well. So it was a uh, Johnny Clegg was the singer. It was a white guy, but it was a black band. And so, you know, they were kind of 80s, but they had some really, really cool stuff. 
and um, they had the Beatles, like um, Tom Waits, I, who I hated at the time and then I got mm. to really love. Um, Dollar Brand, another South African jazz pianist. Um, so, yeah, you can see it's not really in one direction. Yep. They also weirdly had had some like heavy fusion records, like <laughs> this Swedish band called Focus um, and like Chick Corea, like Electric Period. I don't know why they had that because they weren't particularly like into fusion, but um, they just listened to that along with all their other music, along with, you know, just pop music at the time as well. Um, plenty of Billy Joel and... <laughs> you know, um, Tina Turner, like, so yeah, as you can see, like, it's kind of all over the place. Uh, but that's something that I thought was really cool, like that they could just show an interest in, in an art form like music. Yep. Um, was just the fact that the piano was in your house, was that the reason you started playing it or was there a, was there a penis that you heard through, through your mum and dad's um, music that made you want to play? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, no, just because it was there. I mm-hmm. didn't I didn't know anyone who played really well. Like there was, like my teacher played well, but I didn't mm. see her around playing. There's no one in the family played it. Um, and yeah, there was no, no one at school really played either. Um, it was just because it was there. And uh, like even my, my piano teacher... I started with her when I was about six and a couple of years after I started learning, she moved. Um, so I didn't have piano lessons, but I just used to get on there and mess around, uh, make up songs using all the white keys. Right. So um, did you take to the lessons well? Was it something you like really average. enjoyed or you really had to? No, I think I was pretty pretty much average. Like I was really enthusiastic um, but it wasn't like my thing, my main thing. It was just something I, I kind of did. Okay, so what was your main thing? Um, well, I was I was kind of into rock climbing <laughs> when I was when I was that age, like yep. uh, as a kid, um, and just I, I didn't really have a thing. So yeah, playing was just you know part of one of the things I used to do. Like yeah. I wasn't I wasn't yeah particularly like good at it but I was really keen and I used to um, also compose pieces. I, I can't say they were like fully finished compositions but right, right. I was always making stuff up. That's probably the main difference to say, you know, maybe your average average kid doesn't doesn't feel like making up songs. I gotcha. That makes sense. Um, yeah. So when was the point when you thought, okay, I think this m- music is – a little bit more than just another thing that we're doing. When did, when did that become apparent? Um, sort of towards the end of school. Um, I, when I was in year, uh, year ten at school, uh, I was at Sydney Grammar, which was like an all boys school, and um, I didn't mind it. It was a good school, but I used to whinge a lot, like a lot, to my mum, and she said, "Well, why don't you change?" And uh, I kind of was like, oh, I didn't realise that she was taking me seriously. But I auditioned, because of that, she made me audition for the Con, which was a music-focused school. Um, and I got in on composition, not piano playing. And um, it was just like some of the other kids that I met there who were a little more like kind of advanced in music. I just got got a bit more influenced by them. It's not that I really wanted to become a musician, but they, you know, that sort of influenced me to to spend more time on it and be a bit more um, directed. Mm. So, can you explain to me the difference between getting into the con for as uh, for composition as opposed to being an instrument player? What's the difference here? I don't quite understand. Ah, uh, so I did have a little book of compositions, um, and I think there's very few kids that actually kind of write anything down musically. So the bar's not that high. So, you know, as a instrumentalist, I think it's it's a bit more competitive. Like so I did play piano, but probably on the strength of my piano playing, I, I probably wouldn't have got in. 
Okay. But the fact that I was also writing music, they thought, you know, maybe that um, that that's something that's worth uh, developing. Mm. So how long were you at the con? Did you do the full full course? Just the last three years of school. Okay. And there was a cup. There was a couple of uh, jazz musicians there that you know I'd like. I didn't know anything about jazz. So I'd never played it. Had no interest in it. And it took me about a year. So in year ten. I still thought it was stupid, and then by year eleven, uh, I I was really thought it was it was really cool and was like trying to play it. Yeah, that's cool. Um, mm. Were you playing in in um, school type bands at that stage? When was your first sort of band experience apart from apart oh, from the con? I had yeah, I had this terrible rock bands with two of my friends. Uh, in the neighborhood, this is going back, you know, when we were maybe 11 or 12. I, like, I used to play guitar in it. It was called <laughs> Stable Table and the Square Chairs. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we, we, never, we never did a gig. <laughs> so, but that was, that was the first band. <laughs> That's one of the best band names I've ever heard. That's brilliant. I know, maybe we should have a comeback. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so when the con finished, what was what was the plan there? Did you did you know that you wanted to continue on and do music, or was it? Ah, uh, no i I didn't know what I wanted to like that. I wanted to be a musician. I didn't even know really what what it entailed, even though I was at the mm. con. But I had no idea of like what a professional musician does. Um, I. But I did start playing in bands around that time, like um, professionally in that it was for money. So uh, I joined this this salsa band. At that time there was a, a salsa night in um, uh, in Fairfield, or Bosley Park, mm-hmm. um, at Marconi Club. So, you know, like there'd be like 13-piece Latin bands. Um, and I got really into it. I was like really enthusiastic. I used to love going to rehearsal. Like everyone else used to hate it. Mm. Um, I, I kind of had to keep secret how much I loved being at rehearsal. And um, at the same time, like I was also kind of into rock and um, this guy, Michael Lira, who used to have a band, Vicious Harry Mary, he called me to join his band, uh, Darth Vegas. That was like a metal kind of band, but they had an accordion player, she, uh, Svetlana, who's awesome, who played MIDI accordion. Right. And when, when she left, um, I became like her fill-in. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I was doing like those two very different things at the same time. Um, we, we went to Byron and supported Regurgitator. It was kind of, kind of a different, you know, whole different side that that's as Darth Vegas, not the. That Latin was Darth band, Vegas, right? and then yeah, the Latin band yeah. was was in the, in the club. Yeah, cool. Now you said that Latin band was the Fairfield area. Were the Marin Brothers around at that stage? They were, but yep. they were like the good musicians. Yep. So it was a while before like I got to actually play with them. So you know, like not everyone doing it was uh, was a professional musician. Like there were a lot of hobbyists who, which is really cool. Like who just wanted to play and and had enough skills to, you know, to play through songs. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I kind of, I saw them at the club and I was like, I got introduced to them and I was like, oh, these guys are like really good musicians. And you got to, got to play yeah. with them later and on. And then anyway. later on I, yeah. I played with their band Veneno mm-hmm. um, and recorded on their album, which is, which is really nice. Yeah. So when did you start? I mean, because you're very, you're very known for your experimental playing yeah. and your your synth and and yeah. keys and and finding stuff that maybe other people wouldn't think to find. And when did yeah. the interest in synthesizers and um, sound design and when did that start coming into your head? Were you were you, at, were you just oh, playing yeah, piano at this question. at this stage, playing in these bands, or was, was yeah. your mind starting to switch towards no? This I was stuff? I was playing piano. Um, but the music I was listening to was, yeah, like I, I was into a lot of more experimental music. Um, that was around when Napster came out. Mm-hmm. And so you could suddenly like 
listen to all this music that you didn't have access to before. And I found out about this guy, John Zorn, uh, who had Sidic Records and uh, just like, yeah, made a lot of like quite experimental music. Um, it's not similar to what I'm doing now, but um, so yeah, even though I was playing piano, I, I was listening to all these other kind of things. Um, but I didn't really get into like different keyboard sounds until quite a lot later. From the the Latin band and and Darth Vegas, um, where did things sort of sort of move from there? Well, um, I was also um, there was a few things going on. I used to um, uh, okay, so I was part of this. There was a Latin jam session, which. Um, my friend Vincent Sebastian, who's another member of, of this band with Adam, um, Oyobi, he used to organize this, this Latin jam session. And that, uh, he asked me to be part of the house band and Adam as well, that's how I met him. Mm-hmm. And um, a lot of musicians used to go to that, not only like from all different styles of music. So that was sort of like what, how I got introduced to a lot more musicians. And through that, people would start to ask me to do gigs in, you know, whatever kind of band they were doing. Um, just being out there playing. And once you, you know, once you're around playing, people see you and and kind of ask you to do other things. Um, then around, around that time, I also had a housemate who's an awesome jazz trumpet player, Nick Garbett, and he started... Uh, put, put together a reggae band called The Strides. Um, so I started playing with them as well. Oh, so you, you started playing with The Strides right at the start? Almost at the start. Uh, okay. Originally they didn't have keyboards. It was okay. like a, it was an instrumental group. And then they added keys like with myself and, uh, and a singer. Uh, then that was, that was Ras Ronnie. And then, then two more vocalists. And yeah, so the band grew, but from almost near the start. Mm. And Carlos Adura's blown drums, yeah? Yeah. 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 Cool. Actually, originally was Al Hicks, mm-hmm. who's a, a Grammy Award winning documentary maker now. Really? He did the, wow. the Quincy Jones documentary. First, he did ah, Clark right. Terry, um, who he'd met through studying. Clark Terry's an amazing jazz trumpet player who um, was like also a really important educator. And taught heaps of people, and um, he was a, so uh, Al Hicks, this this guy from Wollongong, who was originally the originally the drummer of the Strides, moved to the states and just started working with his other his other friend Serge, like surfy guy from Wollongong. The two of them made this documentary on um, on Clark Terry, and the documentary was really good, really well done. It was their first project; they'd never done anything like it. And um, it it just took off. And Clark Terry was was a mentor to Quincy, so they ended up doing the Quincy Jones documentary as well. Wow, this is this is the Netflix documentary, right? That I'm not sure. Ah, oh, okay. Um, it could be. Did it come out not long ago? A couple of years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the, the one. one. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Okay, so um, you're getting called to do all this work. Yeah, at, at, and at, at what stage there did did you start to think, oh, actually, I can actually make a living from this? Because you, like you said, you yeah. weren't quite sure. Yeah, I mean, I did. The other thing I left out is that I did uh, study music. I after after school, I went to New South Wales Uni, mm-hmm. so it was something I thought I could do, but I didn't. I just didn't have an idea of what direction. Um, so I just basically. Uh, worked on whatever I got asked and whatever I thought was good, like a mixture of of both. Um, and yeah, but without without maybe much conviction in terms of like what I was doing, but I just kept doing it and sort of um, started to find maybe more of a niche within within that. Mm. So that niche being what. I guess playing basically like for me it's it's important that the main thing for me is is music that either I've written or that 
that someone else that I know has written. Like that's okay. I gotcha. Oh, that's what you mean by your niche. Okay, right. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, yeah. more or less, and also um, trying to approach music from a way that's not like too piano focused, um, but also you know, but also I can I can play the piano so. Um, trying to mix that together, like mix a few influences and uh, just come at it from an angle that incorporates sort of what are all the different styles I've been listening to. Right. And had your um, your influences started to change? Were you, was your... Yeah, was always. Your listening palette starting to grow and, and who were some of those, those artists that you were starting to listen to? Yeah, like as I was working, I was having to learn like other styles and other other types of music. And I just went through phases like, you know, I got more into soul music and then um, mostly just through having to play it, not uh, not because I really knew anything about it. And then the Latin music as well, like I had to get deeper into that just because of playing it. And, you know, I so I started to listen to it because I liked it. Um, mm. But after, you know, after having to listen to it, to learn it, to play it. Mm. Uh, now, are we getting close to the stage where you're starting to experiment a little bit more? Yeah. Once like, you're starting, you're getting into that, that sort of niche now and, you know, you're, you're doing the work either you've written or someone else has written. So obviously you're in situations where you've got a little bit more freedom to, yeah. to do your thing. Well, yeah, that's right. And all during this time, um, I was also, you know, I was also always writing compositions at home, like uh, mostly on bits of scrap paper. And uh, I have a, a good friend who's a violinist, Daniel Weltlinger. You know, we used to just uh, have like a duo, just just playing kind of um, whatever, really. And that was always a bit more experimental. And then... We we had a group, the Asthmatics, which uh, is still going, although they they live overseas. Um, so it was me, a turntablist, Mickey Morefingers, and, and Daniel. Mickey Morefingers, uh, how yeah. cool is that? What a good name! Yeah, <laughs> and um, so yeah, we were always kind of doing stuff, and he showed me a bit more about like uh, using a using a computer for music, and um, yeah. And using recording software and that kind of thing, um, and actually, our album's finally finished. Mm, mm. So when are we going to see that? Um, maybe, hopefully, in a few months. Awesome. Yeah. Um, cool. That's the, the Ashmatics. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's Looking right. So that, that was kind of going cool. going behind, you know, at the same time. And Darth Vegas was was pretty pretty experimental too, and mm. actually. I did. I was playing keyboard in that in that band, but I just, you know, I was just flicking between patches. I didn't really design the sounds very, very much. I was just like finding whatever sound I needed and right. flicking onto it. So yeah, I had a question a little bit further on. I was going to ask, but I might ask it now since we're kind of we're kind of talking about um, sound design and, and going from patches and when you. When you're creating new sounds, um, yep. do you hear that sound in your head and then start trying to design that sound or do you sort of find a preset and go, that kind of sounds cool, I might start messing with that? I think you kind of yeah. sort of answered that question. That's a really good question. More of mostly the second way around, finding a okay. preset and trying to manipulate it. But often it's trying to, for me anyway, like... um. I think the first, the first th- time that I tried to get a sound that I heard was um, uh, I heard Flying Lotus and like the way the keyboard sound that he he wasn't playing keyboard it was a sample, but the the pitch was like wavy and mm. it just sounded so cool. So I found that if I put my uh, my keyboard just with like a road sound but through a vibrato pedal, yeah, it would kind of remind me of that. Uh, so I just started doing that and then and put a delay pedal after it and if you kind of like 
mess around with the delay with your foot, that obscures it a bit more. Uh, so it's simple things, but uh, it makes a big difference. I saw you doing that stuff in that um, that rooftop feed. Your head would kind of drop down <laughs> and then you're messing around on the floor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that, yeah. Yeah, so that that's using that's one way that's using guitar pedals, mm-hmm. um, and I think it's it's a good thing to try and um, copy a sound that you're never going to be able to copy or imitate a sound you can never do. Like, I'm not that interested in like trying to get the whatever like the Mellotron sound from Strawberry Hills because. It, strawberry Fields, <laughs> sorry, yeah, yeah, not the Strawberry that. Hills Hotel <laughs> <laughs> from Strawberry Fields. Or, you know, some like famous keyboard sound. Um, but yeah, like, so it's, I haven't really tried to to do that to like emulate a famous keyboard sound, but rather like uh, just try and get close to sounds that might might not have been made on a keyboard or might have been mm-hmm. like sampled and then degraded in the sampling process or something. When, when was the first synthesizer that you saw? Or that, oh, that, that I you saw? Mm. Um, and you went, ah, oh, fuck, I want one of these. This is cool. Oh, God, I I can't remember. Um, the first analog synth that I bought, though, mm-hmm. uh, I went to someone's house and uh, it was like a party and I went into one of the room, right, and this dude's got... Um, just all these synthesizers in his room, like some of them he was modifying, so they were open, and also um, like smoke, like a stage kind of smoke machine and strobe lights. <laughs> and I was like, "This is the craziest room I've ever seen." Yeah. Um, and I was talking to the guy, and he was like, "One of the synths he was he was uh, going to sell it. it was a uh, Korg MS10, which is like a monophonic." Analog synth, so that and I, I bought that off him. That was the first first synth that I bought. Cool. Um, okay, I, that's, yeah. Um, sorry, were you going to say something? Oh no, I was just going to say I didn't really know what it was. Like it was just it seemed like it would sound good. Right. <laughs> that's that's cool. Um, okay, so we're at we're at the strides, and you're you know also. Taken on other gigs and projects and stuff. What was sort of what sort of came after the strides and, and Ashmatics? Um, I started playing with um, this Ethiopian singer that lives in mm. in Sydney, Dereb, the ambassador. Um, and again, it was through a housemate who was playing bass in the band. Uh, and um, I played played in that band for a few years. That was a really good experience, like getting my head around that music. Um, I, I just really loved it as soon as I heard it. Um, and I had to, again, like I had to change the sounds I was using for that because I needed it like a organ, uh, mm-hmm. which I had no experience with. And I found this secondhand organ in a uh, music shop that doesn't exist anymore, Smithy's, that uh, was going cheap and like was just sitting there it's a it's a transistor organ Hammond, um, so I I started playing that, um, and I also played in in a band called Watusi, which was um, Oscar Jimenez projects, uh, like rock Afro Colombian kind of roots band. Was, si- was Simon Olsen playing in that band? At I that replaced stage? Simon Olsen, so. So after he left, I think they couldn't find a guitarist. Ah, this is where you came because you came in to replace a guitar. When, yeah. When I, when you told me, you know, when you wrote to yeah. me saying that, yeah, you joined Watusi to replace a guitar, I was thinking maybe that was Simon. Yeah, that's right. And that's when I, uh, at that time, I, I also had the organ, so I like put that through an amp, and because um, I feel like if you're playing with other with guitars. Sometimes for a keyboard, it'll it'll fit sit better if you play through an amp, right? Rather than like there's a keyboard speaker or into the PA. Um, so yeah, then I started messing with amplifiers and um, yeah, putting keyboards through amps basically. Going back to Dereb the ambassador, I've been listening to his that music for the last couple of days. 
Yeah. And it's really cool, man. Yeah. It's kind of got this little bit of um, the Cat Empire vibe to it, but but with Derib's very unique, like, Ethiopian voice in the language. And yeah. I just love the way that he sings. Um, and, um, um, like, the African voice has that very unique vibrato. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love it. I, I think it's really cool. I listen to... I listened to the the later album and then the 2016 EP. I've been listening yeah. to those the last couple of days. There's, there's one really other cool. album before that uh, which I didn't play on but which is also amazing. The first mm-hmm. album they did, uh, the thing is finding it. It's pretty rare. But if you find the first Derek the Ambassador album, you should definitely. I think it's on. Um, it's a red. Got I think a red it's on cover. Apple Music. It's definitely not on Spotify. Yeah, um, it's not on Spotify. A... Oh, no, that's something else. It's. Magnetica, no, that's not it. Yeah, it's just got on on here for Apple Music. It's Volume Two, the EP. Yeah, and then Ethiopia is the 2018 yeah um, album. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the they're the two things I've been listening to. It's really yeah, cool. yeah. Volume yeah. Two was produced by Tony Bukem, who is a producer from Sydney who moved to uh, I think he's in LA now. He's in the US. Okay, um, and he uses a lot of old like old equipment. Um, so that that gives a really cool sound. Yeah. Um, who was who was the band on that that, that um, was the second album that second album. Yeah, uh, the okay. Two thousand eighteen album. Oh, on the second album was Ross Ferraro on drums, mm-hmm. um Peter Farah on sax and also Solomon, uh an Ethiopian sax player from Melbourne. Mm-hmm. Um we had JP on guitar. Um we had Yusuf, an Ethiopian bass player who came down to Sydney for that. He lives in uh he lives up north, um Byron Bay. And uh let's see who am I missing out? Dominic Kirk played percussion on that one. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um Iko Akrif played on the, the previous records. Mm-hmm. Um Nick Garbett had a trumpet appearance on that record. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's that was the band. Um, yeah. Peter Farah is an amazing sax player um, who he'd been playing with, with Dara, you know, from the beginning of the band and absorbed a lot of that style of music. And another guy who played in the band was Matt Odignong, who's on the, the earlier albums, um, who's another uh, sax player, musician who... Um, has kind of helped me a lot. Um, like I played, I play in his band, Mister Ott, mm-hmm. um, and he was the first guy that showed me how to write an invoice. Like I used to send really, really bad invoices, <laughs> uh, and he was like, oh, "Your invoices are terrible," and like he gave me a <laughs> template. <laughs> oh, so how, how did your old invoices used to look? I'm interested. Oh, uh, like I just used to kind of like <laughs> type them out, like. I made my own template, you know, like just out of text. Um, and, yeah, with no, like, proper formatting. I think right. they, were, they were horrible. <laughs> so, yeah, so your, your mates go, mate, you got to look professional here, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, he, yeah, he, he, like, took the time to, like, send me a proper template. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I played, I played quite a bit with him um, and he was, like, a – you know, he's an amazing player and like also a really strong jazz player. Uh, so I, I'd heard heard him when I was a bit younger uh, and I was always kind of like looked up to how, how good he was at playing jazz. Is Dara still around these days? Yeah. Um, actually, we've been working on a couple of new songs. Like oh, the man. he's taken a bit of a break from music Um but he's, yeah, he's working on new, new things. Uh, it's quite, it's a challenge, like um, maintaining a group in a style that's that's not considered the, the sort of main, uh, mainstream style. Not even mainstream is in popular, but you know, it's gets okay, you can get get sidelined in a way quite easily. Um, mm. And yeah, so it's not it's not impossible, but it's just it's it is tough maintaining it. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Okay, so um, 
your alter ego, plain face. When did that? Yeah. When did that come about? When did you start um, thinking? Oh, I'm gonna thinking, go- yeah, in about 2017. Mm-hmm. Probably. Oh, two- that's fairly recent. Yeah, okay. All right, probably cool. 2016. Yep. Uh, I I was already working on that music, but mm-hmm. um, it was mainly because um, because of Crystal Diola, who is a a musician, but also like DJ and promoter, uh, and she was working for Loki Source at the time, and she basically said to me like, "Do you, can you put something out?" Um, and then I had to actually like be like, okay, that's a real thing. Like I need need a name and uh, and actually put out the put out music and not just like tinker. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was it was kind of thanks to her. Did you recall old compositions for that, or once you once she said we want you to put something out? Did you kind of start from scratch and then um, write that write that EP from there? No, I worked on like stuff that I was working on anyway. So okay. I was doing it, but I, I just didn't have a, hadn't put it together like an outlet for it. Gotcha, I gotcha. Yeah. I gotcha. Um, um, I'll, I'll definitely link all the stuff. Oh, like, everything thanks. we've yeah. basically talked about well, and we're still talking about. I'll put links to it in the show notes. Awesome, and, yes. So thanks. people can go check it out. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I want... To talk a little bit about the sticks, yeah, now, that really fascinates me. That whole what you were telling me about the sticks is a is a um, um, three piece. It's yourself, yep. bass player, yeah, Josh and, and on bass. I'll I'll let you carry on with this. And yeah, and it. and yep. Alon Ilsa um, on drums and this this instrument called the air sticks, which is something he's he's been working on for a while. Um, it's an instrument he designed. With, uh, with a guy that I went to school with, Mark Haverleve. So Mark did the tech side of it and Alon designed it. And he used basically a generic band brand of video game controllers. So he plays in the air. Um, as if you're kind of, if you could imagine like Nintendo Wii, but they're not actually Wii controllers, but it looks a bit like that. Um, and that basically does two things. It's like a, a percussive synthesizer, so you can, it's like playing an air drum kit in a way, but it's not just that. Um, the way he moves will kind of morph the sound from one thing to another, or he can you know, affect different parameters with movement. And I think the idea there was to um, basically electronic music, part of it is, you know, producing at home. And it's hard to recreate that on stage. That's always a challenge. And his solution as like as someone that's done a lot of like improvising and stuff was to create this uh, this instrument to do stuff that sounds produced but is played live. Mm. I was watching the video that you sent me today. Yeah. And um, I'll link that also because it's hard for us to kind of explain yeah, what be- we mean by changing the parameters by moving your hands, but there's one part there, it kind of looks like he's playing drums and, it, and he does mm. a sound, but then he throws his arm out to the right or out to the left and you, the sound almost... Yeah, kind of, that's kind exactly of bow, it. bows out with, yep. with his arm, you know, and and it's it's almost like it's, it's, a, it's like you're watching some interpretive dance. Yeah. But, but the, the the moves he's making with his arms, he's getting sounds. You know, it's it's awesome. Yeah, it's such a cool thing. And we also did some shows um, with two visual artists who yep. are like one one's a professor and one is almost a professor at UTS. Um, and they they work on like fluid motion. So basically, apart from from the the movement influencing the sound, he was also influencing the visuals. Um, so we'd be like behind a screen and uh, everything we'd be playing would like would be triggering these visuals. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll get to do more of that. That's cool. I've just got to let my cat out. Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, you, you guys have got like third-eye laser cat. I've got one-eyed laser cat here. He's <laughs> only got one eye, this one. Oh, shit. <laughs> when was the first time you heard sampling and, and started doing your, own, doing your own sort of sampling? Uh, so... I guess I'd, I would have heard sampling, you know, since I was a kid because 
especially in the '90s, there was so much sampling, but I didn't, I didn't think about it or know what it was. And then um, I think it was really Alon Alon Ilsa, this drummer. Uh, he was playing some Madlib. Um, I didn't know about Madlib. He's a producer, just like such a good producer. And then I, you know, I started listening to to Madlib and all you know all the other started listening to other producers. So was, yeah, through that. Uh, the other album I heard was um, this Hudson Mohawk EP, uh, Polyfolk Dance, which is just crazy. It's it's really cool. Um, so that's I guess that's that uses like I actually have no idea how he made it, which is what's so cool about it. But mm. like sampling and synths and all kinds of things. Mm. Do you remember the first time you tried to sample something? Yeah. Um, I got a copy of Ableton, which is like a really good recording software for sampling. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, I just used to, you know, do it. I think the first thing I sampled was a CD that I'd played on. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> which is, I don't know if that's a good thing, but I, I thought that'd be a good place to start and just like loop stuff and then see what I could do with it. Uh, but it's fun to do something that you don't know a lot about, especially, you know, once you've been playing for a while or doing something for a while, I think it's a really good uh, process to just try something new, like just try something you know nothing about and try and do it. Um, let's talk a little bit now about Oyobi. Yeah. Yep. So like you said, that's uh, Vincent, Sebastian and Adam Ventura and yourself. Yeah. Yep. And it's a uh, um, again experimental, but yeah, I'll, you, yeah. I'll let you explain it. Yeah, it's experimental. I guess I'll put it like this: like um, some of the sounds are, are the the experimental part, but it's uh, you know like rhythmically, the concept is always to be pretty solid, and um, yeah, it's not meant to be like ponderous, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you yeah. know it's a, it's it's dance music as well, yeah. Um, or dance floor music. I know dif- different people might mean different things by dance music, but um, but yeah, it's for a dance floor. And uh, I guess we we used to play live together way back in the day, and it's kind of an extension of that. But um, in the meantime, Vinnie had gotten really into uh, into recording uh, and electronic instruments. Um, you know, so when we got back together and just just jammed out, we had like a new new sound colors to work with, and that kind of led to Oyobi. Mm. Um, you guys released some music, yeah. So the first EP was called Translations with uh, with Q Violin, who's an awesome violinist and singer who uh, who was uh, living in Sydney for a while, but he's he's from. Uh, Arizona, or he's living in Arizona, um, and he's like he's part Brazilian, part uh, Indigenous American, like got all this mixed heritage that comes through in his music. So, uh, yeah, we had a lot kind of like of similar interests. Um, so yeah, he he collaborated on that album with us, and he's on the new one which is coming out uh, in August, and. That's uh, cool. Then the last thing we did was a, a remix for a guy, um, Miles Bigelow, who's a Canadian uh, musician. And his, that track featured this awesome Cuban vocalist, Toto Beriel. And our remix, we just kind of took it apart. So when, when we remix stuff, uh, we kind of do it pretty much live. Like we take some element of the song and pl- actually replay it uh, or replay all, all the other parts of the song. And then kind of remake it. Do you do it in a in a in a band situation though, or like do you, the three of you? Yeah, play it um, live and then yeah. yeah, like we all get in a room and that's that's awesome. And yeah, kind of loop something up and you know maybe stop and start and like you know come up with with ideas uh, and then you know just try flesh them out a bit, um, but without too much you know like planning um, in the. Like since COVID, we have done some stuff where we're like we've done it, at all our parts at home and sent it in, mm. uh, which is cool too. 
Mm. Um, that's actually something that I think, you know, going back to what we were talking about before with with the new way things are and like with COVID and having to, all these restrictions, like if you can record yourself at home, uh, you're at a huge advantage. Uh, so yeah, so being, you know, getting around that and getting set up is I think a really useful thing. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. Do you, just on the uh, home setup thing, do you mm. do... Um, Sort of call in sessions to people yeah. get you to yeah I do to play on stuff yeah, yeah. that's cool and I love doing that I like I've played on stuff for George Maple What's So Not um, some of the other people Bin Juice which is a cool band from Sydney and sometimes I'm not there like with the band like I either do it at a studio or from home and send it and um, I'm really into like doing it from home it's it's really fun like it's a nice way of doing music. Mm. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong, like wrong with doing it that way, and also, especially if I'm sending it to uh, to someone else who's you know who's a does production themselves, I can come up with like different options and sounds and stuff, and right. they can they can gotcha. mess with it. Another group is yeah. uh, to another who are an Australian and an English guy that that live in London. That uh, yeah, I just send stuff. That's cool. That's yeah. really cool. What do you do outside of music? Um, in terms of in terms of work, like just basically a little bit of teaching, but mm-hmm. uh, not that much else. I was like, I was an Uber driver for a little while, uh-huh. um, and yeah, I haven't haven't done that much that much else outside of music in terms of work. What and, about um, what about fun and leisure? Yeah, I just like. You know, I like uh, bushwalking, reading. You know, um, I used to be yeah, I used to be into rock climbing as a kid, but it yeah. completely ruins your hands. Like you can't play an mm. instrument and then try and climb walls. Right. Um, it's. I, I was thinking of a question I was going to yeah. ask today, but then I thought it might be a bit stupid. But maybe no, it's go not ahead because you've just yeah. said that. But it was about about your hands. Yeah, yeah. Um, are you very conscious? Well, obviously you are with the whole rock rock climbing thing. Um, I know some people, um, a couple of guitarists that are super oh. careful, even at home, like cooking and it, all the stuff about damaging your hands. Are you a little bit reckless in that sense or are you really conscious of it? No, it's – it. no, I, I don't think of that. <laughs> I mean, it's not something that even – that comes into my head on a daily basis. I I don't think about it. Okay, uh, but only if it's like in a s- kind of like when it comes to sports or something. Yeah, yeah, like things that are where you really like maybe putting yourself out there with your, with your hands. But yeah, I, I I don't really think about it. Okay, <laughs> it was a bit of a dumb. No, that, it's not a dumb question. That was the at answer all. I had to myself when I was asking myself that question earlier today. <laughs> no, but it's it's not a dumb question because it's kind of interesting to know like what <laughs> what people concern themselves with. Yeah, and yeah, uh, and whether there's things that like either that you're going around thinking about that actually aren't that important, or that you're not thinking about that you should be. Yeah, one of these guys I'm t- talking about specifically. I'm not going to say his name. Yeah. But he's a shredder guitar player. Yeah, like I think, it, yeah, it's a certain type of of person that that would be really worried about this the health of their hands. I think. Yeah, but I mean, I, I don't think it's so much so he can go out and play it, just so he can um can shred. So he can shred, <laughs> you know, like you know, he might be he might be in some yeah. sort of group where he's they're doing speed tests and stuff <laughs> like that. So yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, and uh, uh, and some people have to worry about their nails if you're a classical guitarist. Yeah, true, eh? Uh, yeah. yeah. Colours and <laughs> so, colours of the fingernails and stuff like that. No, yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to ask, do you – I mean, you said this right at the start. Mm. I mean, you, due to COVID, you know, you've, you've um, gone back to practising. Yeah. Um, b- before COVID – were you finding time to take yourself away to practice? Not so much 
to practice your creating and your um, compositions, yep. but for your facility, do you find yourself? Yeah, I go through phases. Um, I find the thing that helps me the most is practicing things that I don't don't play in public. Like, for instance, maybe trying to learn a classical piece or practicing or, or like learn a standard. Not like not so I can can play it to people, but just to keep keep the mind open. Um, and then, yeah, just, you know, scales and regular stuff like that. I, I still practice, but I go through phases where I, I practice more and others where usually, like, if I'm busy, I, I won't practice as much. Of course. I, yeah. The less busy I am, the more I practice. Yeah. Um, earlier today, I asked you to come up with a song. Yeah. Um, just one song that's yeah. had the biggest impact, the greatest impact on you. So I want you to um, tell me what that song is in a minute and then we're going to play uh, yeah. it. We're going to listen to it together. Awesome. Um, and I want you to explain to me um, why you chose that song and when it sort of came about and, and what that what that impact was. Yeah. So um, if you can tell me what that song is now so, um, and who it's by and... Um, I'll press play and then we'll listen and then you can tell me what the what that impact was. Cool. So what we, we're going to listen to is um, Bud Powell, the pianist playing uh, Somewhere Over a Rainbow. Which you can hear playing now. Um, I'll just turn that down a bit. And while it's playing in the background, you, just, you can um, tell us when you first heard the song and, and what that impact was. I think I heard this song kind of like late high school, um, like maybe maybe year 12 or so. And I think I just, it's, uh, I didn't really pick this because cause he's a piano player. It's more um, just like the truthfulness in it, like the lack of sentimentality. Um, I just thought, think is really cool. And he's a, uh, it's you know it's it's quite virtuosic, but it's not that perfect. It's very loose. He eh? sacrifices perfection yeah. to try something, and uh, there's actually a probably more polished version by Art Tatum, which is just incredible as well. Um, but yeah, this one influenced me maybe because of when I heard it as well. It's, uh, um, but yeah, just his approach and there's always something sad about whatever he plays which you know to take like a song like somewhere over a rainbow that um could easily be such a sentimental song and put that kind of like depth into it mm. uh i think is really special what i dig about the recording like it's a very old old analog to tape recording obviously mm. but you can you can hear the, the dirty heads on the tape machine yeah and almost and almost like the the reel to reel tapes has got like a like a loop in it and when it passes the head you yeah go, yeah you're right I actually I wasn't sure if that was someone playing brushes that's what I thought too I was um, having a real good listen but it's not <laughs> I don't think it is I don't think yeah it is. because it's weird if it is he kind of like came in and then was like uh, well he's I, not playing in time <laughs> yeah <And laughs> but I mean just, just but, I mean, that, like you said that that song and that pl- his play uh, bud I was playing on that is very very loose. Yeah, I also chose that because I think you know it's, a, it's something that I just wanted people to hear. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, what's a piece of gear you wish you had? An old synth, maybe, or something? Probably a, an interface with heaps of channels, so I don't have to keep replugging everything. Uh, right. Like, okay. like heaps of really good quality channels. Yeah, that, right. That would be cool if I could. So, what have you? Two. What have you got now? Um, I've got a Focusrite Claret, mm. which is really good. But yeah, that good. How many? How many ins and outs? It's got four. So four, right? Um, yeah. which is a step. I used to have two, but I'm still like always plugging things in and out. And uh, right, probably someone listening to this will be like, I oh, just get a. Behringer thing with all the. Uh, 
<laughs> they say they say Behringer's getting better. They are. I'm not so sure. Are they? Yeah, like Behringer's yeah. got all these new synths now. Um, oh, right. Some of them are clones and they're like, they're good. They made an 808. Right. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really good. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Yay, Behringer. It's, it's actually <laughs> like, in terms of instruments, the last, I think, five years and to the present day are this really good time for for like new keywall synths and stuff. There's just like so much more coming out. Um, right. So much more I, useful. I do have a question yeah. here regarding keyboards. Mm. Um, if you were able to make a keyboard yep. or a synth, um, do you think you'd be able to make that? Not not literally, yeah. but... You, or is there, is there something out there at the moment that's pretty close to everything you need in a, in a keyboard or... I don't think that the the keyboard that does everything is is always the best option. Like you know, I guess you you might need that for a gig, but um, like there there are some really good kind of everything keyboards. But then you got to dive into menus, and sometimes it's it's interesting just to get a piece of gear that just does one thing and and just use it for that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that's more what I look for when I'm probably like choosing a piece of gear. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Um, yeah, with the interface, have you looked at like maybe the eighteen uh, eight or or sixteen channel UAD interfaces? And yeah, I think you yes, got the onboard something like that. Would, onboard processing and I know that's yeah something like that would be would be awesome. Yeah. And then you know you can get some of those those pedal yeah. plugins even. <laughs> but yeah, you know if I was gonna, the other thing that would be cool to have would be like a a, a Mellotron, a real oh, Mellotron. Cool. Um, because yeah, they sound so cool. Yeah. All right. So what do you got? What have you got coming up, man? Um, obviously COVID's still here, so let's just work through that. Um, yeah. yeah. Let's talk about some stuff. Um, so. I, we already mentioned about the, the new Yoyobi album, which is a full length album coming out on at Jazz Records, and um, another a couple of tracks that I produced for Wallace, who's an awesome singer um, from New Zealand who lived in Sydney, but who's living in London. Um, her album comes out in September, uh, which yeah, which I produced a few of the songs on, which I'm looking forward to hearing. Um, another little trio record with um, with a, a drummer, Mike Bentley, young drummer who's really good. Um, and that one is recorded and probably be out, uh, I think, this month. What 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 type of style of music is that? Um, it's very improvised. It's okay, cool. Uh, we'd never met it. Well, we'd never played before and never really all met each other. And we just, I thought I was just coming oh, wow. over for a jam, but now it's, <laughs> now it's being released, which is cool. Great. Yes, it does. Um, and I'm working on a new Plain Face release, which is, I don't have a date for it. And also uh, another group that I've been playing with, um, with Ross, Ross Ferraro and Jerol, awesome bass player from, from The Goods, mm. um, called Cardboard Heroes. We we have a the project that's in in the works that should be out. Um, I think another another one that I contributed to, which should be out soon, with um, Henry Hicks, who's just a wicked bass player from uh, from Melbourne, who does this like kind of like a jazzy house, but pretty lo-fi and uh, and interesting. Um, and yeah, and the Asthmatics. Album is is done, mm. so that's they're the it's next cool, things. Busy, to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, COVID what? COVID what? Eh? <laughs> well, like, yeah, it's all all this fantastic. Some of these stuff, like you know, things get re- get recorded, and it, sometimes it takes ages for them to yeah to see the light of day. Um, also, a good friend of mine. This is not something that's coming out, but it just came out. Um, Natalie Slade uh, did a really good record. Um, called Control, which a couple of the songs we wrote here and then they were recorded by Melbourne musicians. Um, but 
yeah, that's a new one, which is which is exciting because I just saw the record and it sounds sounds really good. Awesome. Um, oh, what else? Oh, Yobi's got a couple of remixes coming out too for Milan and the Goods. Mm-hmm. Mm. Cool, man. All right, Danny Pliner, thanks so much for for doing this, man. Like, yeah, shame we're not in the room together. Um, yeah, that was the plan. Next time. Um, um, but this is cool. Yeah, thanks so much for doing it and, and also for documenting all this music that's going on in Sydney. Oh, sweet ass, man. I, I love it. Yeah. You guys you guys are all awesome and I'm uh, I'm really privileged to get to um, like hear your stories and also, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm preparing to sit down and, and like, like I was saying, I was sitting down to talk to you tonight, um, the last few days I've been listening to your music and I've been, you know, like I said, I've been listening to Darab and the, the Yobi stuff and your Plain Face stuff. It introduces me to all that new music too, which is just awesome. Yeah. It's oh, great. Thank you. You guys keep doing what you're doing. Eh? It's killer. Yeah, no, thanks yeah. so much for having me. Sweet as man. I, and I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Look after yourself. Yeah, you too. Stay well. See you, Danny. See ya. All right. Catch you, bro. Bye.